Welcome to the National Museum of Ireland Country Life. My name is Rosa Meehan. I'm one of the curators here. In this video, we're going to look at the Irish Folklife Collection. We'll take a look at the furniture collection with a particular focus on chairs. We'll think about the craftsmanship, the styles, the design, the making. The chairs on display have been collected over the last hundred years by other previous curators. Let's step inside and have a look. The Irish Folklife Collection is home to thousands of objects that allow us to rediscover life in Ireland in the past. Throughout this gallery, you will find objects that tell us about traditional life in Ireland, with a focus on 1850 to 1950. The items of furniture like chairs, tables and settle beds were not found in every house. Some houses had very little furniture at all, while others had a large range of furniture including large pieces like presses or dressers. These functional domestic pieces are sometimes called vernacular furniture. Others may call them traditional furniture, but whatever the name, they were usually made in the local area where they were used. Some were made by a member of the household and others were made by specialist carpenters. They were all handmade often of local or imported pine, and sometimes reusing materials such as wooden boxes. But particularly from the 1960s, we saw a huge change in the furniture found in people's homes. Mass or factory produced furniture replaced the older style, handmade furniture. In many homes, furniture of formica or chipboard replaced solid wood pieces, and handcraft furniture became the reserve of the more well-to-do or wealthy. Chairs found in traditional Irish homes were not only made of wood, they were also made of materials such as sugon, which can be described as rope made from twisted or plaited straw. For example, the straw chair suits the shape of the sitter, giving ample support, but it is not very long lasting as it can attract pests and is also more easily worn. It was also a fire hazard when you consider how important the hearth was in the traditional Irish home, where chairs would be drawn up beside the hearth. Here you will see two identical armchairs from the tomb area in County Galway. Made from ash, this chair features an attractive grain pattern that is mellowed to a warm, pale, golden colour. They have interesting designs where the front board of the seat joins the armrest supports. And this is a chair made by Thomas Durkin. Tom was a cooper, a carpenter and a shanky, or a storyteller. He was from near Tour Wicady in County Mayo. Tom worked at shipbuilding in Scotland in the second half of the 19th century before he returned home to Mayo. His chair is heavier and larger than many others in the National Museum. It is made from ash and oak. T. Durkin is stamped on many places on the chair. It was made using a steel punch Tom had used in his shipbuilding days. Different classes of trees were identified in ancient Ireland. The oak tree was considered King of the Forest. Durkin drew on this tradition when he described his chair as being made from the Seven Woods of the Cross to Colm O'Loughlin, who published their conversation in a religious journal article in 1964. Let's take a closer look at the vernacular furniture and what it may tell us. So who would have typically constructed the chairs within these past communities? It would have been a skilled carpenter uh, that uh, made this chair, and this chair came from uh, Roman County Monaghan. This chair would have dated to the 1900s, made from pine wood. The finish on it was um, maybe to make it look um, like a mahogany chair, a little bit more fancy maybe. But I quite like the design of the chair as well. Um, you know, the, the little bit of the board back on it and the little bit of detail there on, on, on it here. And as you can see as well, it, it looks like there was, you know, that there was inlay on it, like, but that was the finish that was put on it. This particular chair would be known as a hedge chair, made from wood sourced locally in the forest. There's a lot of skill in making a chair like that. The spindles there on the back of it, like, they are all hand uh, made and sometimes I'd say by hand, maybe chisels. You certainly would be talking probably maybe a day and a half to make a chair like that. Looking at it, I wouldn't imagine there would have been glue used because when the wedge went down into it, it, it spread it out the leg to the joint, to the hole that was there, um, and the, the, there was no need for, for glue, and that's what held it together. There has been quite a lot of them low to the ground, 
but um, I'm not quite sure. It may be we are as well. That's what I would firmly believe is that it's more um, the age of the chair that has wore on the ground over the years. And you can see how they're spread out. Um, and that was to stop it maybe from falling over so that it would be fairly durable as well on the ground. There would have been craft people, carpenters, and then there would have been the handymen. The handymen mightn't have as much of experience of maybe the carpenter. And that's probably the difference in some of the quality of the chairs as well. The weight bearing of the chair would be very important, mainly because of the, of the, of the weight of it and the way it's set on the ground but that would be, again, down to the design. You'll never go hungry, say, when you make a chair. Um, but I suppose there's two ways of looking at that, like is that, does that mean you sit on the chair to eat, or does it mean that for the making of the chair? Many people have their own preferred chairs or seats, but some may have pieces of furniture that were given to them by previous generations. Each piece of furniture at the Nash Museum tells a story. Who was its maker? Why were the materials chosen? Where did they come from? What is the particular design? Do visit the Nash Museum and explore our wonderful collections. We will be delighted to welcome you. One of our distinctive chair designs is that of the Sligo or Tum chair. With its intriguing origins and enduring presence, they continue to inspire contemporary furniture design. There are 16 Sligo or Tomb chairs in the National Museum's collection, all of which were acquired from 1931 to 2019. These chairs were so named after two towns in the west of Ireland where they were first recorded. This chair type continues to be made in the Tomb area of County Galway to this day. In 1832, the Dublin Penny Journal described it as an ancient oak chair from the village of Drumcliff in County Sligo. It is a three-legged chair with a very distinctive seat design and it is well made using ancient woodworking techniques. This exhibition combines the chairs with the public art project by artist David Lilburn and architect Jan Froberg. Their project involved making miniature metal sculptures of the chair and placing these around the town of Tume in County Galway. This created a trail through the town to highlight aspects of the town's history and heritage. These chairs were commonly constructed with peg tenons and dowels, typically using wood such as oak or ash or pine. With its appealing characteristics, the Sligo or Tomb chair are still made by Carob Crafts in Tomb today. In the mid-1960s, LOD set up Carob Crafts workshop in Tomb. Among the most popular furniture made there was the three-legged chair. He said he remembered it from his childhood, but it was the discovery of an old chair, possibly 200 years old, that helped the revival of this chair type. Al employed master craftsman Tom Dowd to make the chairs, and Tom passed his skills on to many apprentices. Tom later established his own business, Dowd Furniture, in Kilconley near Tomb, and he continued making this type of chair until his retirement in 2010. Tom's craftwork led to a revival in popularity for the Sligo or Tomb chair and kept this tradition alive, enabling people from all over the world to rediscover the design. <coughs> to start off with a... i just pop this up here now. Like that. These are all the bits and pieces for the old Irish arm chair. Two pegs, one there and one there. Drive them in with a little bit of glue as well to keep them. And then that's, that's locked for life. The wings, this is the mortise, this is the tenon again. So here we go, this should fit here. Mortises still aren't cut here. They're marked all right, but they're not cut. So that just gives an idea that they, they go down there. And when they come out through the mortise and turn them there, they will, will then look like this. And this uh, peg has to be just got in tight and, and a peg put down there at the end. Now this 
piece here, it's there to help to carry the chair. You just do this then and enjoy. <laughs> yes. John and Gabriel Blake of Carob Crafts were apprenticed under Tom Dowd and they now continue this tradition. Their manufacture of the chair still proves to be popular with ash, oak and teak variations available. Let's see how John and Gabriel's production of the chair differs from earlier techniques. Now we're going to plane up the, the timber for the back leg of the chair through the thicknesser to get it nice and even and so we can mark it for the bandsaw. Now we're to go to the bandsaw and cut out the back leg. Yeah, we're just going to mortise these out. I'm just going to do the tent now for the armchair, for the, where the arm goes into the front leg. Right, we're going to carve out shamrock in the back of the old Irish. Sure. For this we use a carving chisel and uh, a mallet. That's finished now. We, we are, are ready now to put the, the uh, tomb armchair together. This one now is made in American ash. We also make it in American oak and uh, African teak. They were made originally in teak because that was the timber that was mostly available. We make them in the oak and the ash. We hope to eventually be able to make them in native timber, but it'd have to be a hardwood. So that's into there. And the front rail. Now we put the last of the front leg in. Look at the angle. Right. That's it. Do the arms. Waste them in. Now that is the chair together. Uh, we'll cut these bits off when the glue is set. Now this is a finished chair in Iroko Teak. This is the finished product and it's all been sanded and finished off. It's just on the natural teak finish. The unique seat design and simple effective form of the Sligo tomb chair continues to inspire. Come and see the many examples of these chairs at the National Museum of Ireland. Many examples of the Sligo or tomb chair are on display here at the museum. This armchair was constructed by Cooper and carpenter Thomas Hughes of Clun Keeley, Toome, County Galway. Made in the early 20th century from ash, this chair was presented to the museum by Edward Richards Orphan of Grange Furniture. Inspired by the arts and crafts movement, which began in the late 19th century throughout Europe, Richards Orphan, W.B. Yeats and others found the Sligo or Toome chair to hold core values associated with it. Clean lines, honest native materials, traditional craft techniques, and robust, attractive furniture for everyday use. Thomas Hughes made this chair from beech and ash. This style of chair shows the skill of the craftsman with arms that extend from the back and are secured to supports at the front. The poet, William Butler Yeats, his wife, George, 
and architect William Scott commissioned a number of Sligo or tomb chairs for his tower house at Thor Bally Lee, County Galway in 1918. The photographer Tomás O'Hagin from Kinvara, County Galway photographed the interior of Thor Valley Lee in 1926. One of O'Hagin's photographs includes a three-legged armchair. Thor Valley Lee is closely associated with some of W.B. Yeats' most famous work, including his volumes, The Tower and The Winding Stair. We might imagine Yeats sitting on this three-legged chair as he wrote his famous poetry. The Thomas Hughes chair was the inspiration for a version of the chair made by Grange Furniture Industries at Monks Grange, County Wexford from the late 1920s to the early 1930s. These chairs incorporated a trefoil in their design. That's a Celtic motif of three overlaid circles carved into the back of each chair. A recent addition to the National Museum of Ireland Decorative Arts Collection was created in 2005 by renowned artist Sasha Sykes. She named her chair the Carlo Chair. Let's hear from Sasha Sykes herself. So my name is Sasha Sykes. I'm an artist and designer based in Dublin. And 15 years ago, I made my version of the Sligo chair, which is the Carlo chair, because I'm from Carlo. Um, the chair is made uh, with the cast back. I found the most interesting part of the Sligo chair is this wonderful slab piece for the back, continuous piece the whole way from top to bottom. And I wanted to focus on this to incorporate materials from Carlo that I would, um, very particular to me and the area where I grew up. For me, the back, this back piece is like the work of art that the whole chair centres around. And um, obviously working in acrylics and resins is very different to working in, in woods. And the construction of it and the fabrication is very, very different. You approach it in a very different way. And with the original Sligo chair, it's construction is very much based around this um, a, a plug that goes through the back. Um, so there's a, a sort of tenon morse at the back. And with my version of it, obviously it's a different approach, but I still wanted to um, highlight that aspect of the back. So for me, the way I constructed it was um, the main part of the seat and the legs are made out of acrylic and the back panel is predominantly resin. The back of the chair, which is the, the focal point in, in my chair, is made through casting liquid resin and embedding all this material that I collected from the woodland floor. It's a quite a complex process because you have to build it up in layers, um, especially given the curve. You have to um, sort of move. It has to be done over time where you move things and you're, you're, you're curving at the same time as casting because obviously it's a liquid and it floats to a level. So we add in all the different materials in the layers and there's probably eight or 10 different layers in there. And then towards the top, we put in the acrylic block, which is where the seat is joined onto the back panel casting. So the casting of the, ch of the chair of this back panel took place over probably three or four weeks. Um, what we do is we would put in one layer and allow it to dry and then add to it and build it, and build it up slowly, slowly, slowly. And then, of course, it has to be completely shaped. So it has to be sanded back to get exactly the right angles, to get exactly the right shape, to get exactly that right finish down at the bottom and at the top. Um, so the, the original casting is actually quite rough. And then, you, and then you shape it to what you want at the end of it. And the resin itself takes, you know, it, it's pretty much dry within um, 24 hours, it's probably 95% dry, but you need, to, you need to leave it for, say, a week after all the casting is done to really let it harden, and then you can cut it and sand it and polish it. So the rest of the chair is actually made from acrylic sheet, which is um, cast in big, huge sheets, and then we cut it up and uh, cement it. It's kind of, it's a welding method, actually, because what you're doing is you're like the, the front legs are actually welded onto the underside of the seat. It's a kind of um, cementing also, where, where you're melting the surface of the seat and the top of the leg together. So it's a chemical bond. The Sligo or Tomb Chair continues to inspire makers and designers in the 20th and 21st centuries. Recently, second year students from the Bachelor of Science 
in furniture design and manufacture at the Galway Mayo Institute of Technology, Letterfrack, reimagined the chair for the modern Irish home. Each student designed and made their own chair. So what kind of tools did these carpenters have at their disposal? The tools that's here um, on display would have been used for every day of uh, use in a carpenter's work. Um, first of all, you can see this top one here, an awl it's called, and that was for holding the holes for the legs. And then we have a range of chisels here as well, of different shapes and sizes as well that would have been used. We have brad awls as well, which was very important for our screws. And you can see we have the hammer as well, the claw hammer and some pliers and that. And this particular one here as well is the hand planer. And that was for putting maybe grooves um, in the likes of maybe dresses and some larger furniture. And then of course we have the hand saws here as well. And then we have the, the mallet and then we have the hand planer here as well, a jack plane they're called, and we've quite a few of those. We have the claw hammer, of course, was very important as well, and we have the gauge as well, which was marking out uh, the design in some cases on, on pieces. The tools were made uh, locally by the blacksmith in the area. The, the carpenter maybe would approach him and uh, tell him what was needed. There would be hand forged uh, tools, you know, and hand forged tools like always kept the sharpness. They would go hand in hand, the carpenter and the blacksmith. How much has this practice changed in the 21st century? Let's ask the Blake brothers. The chairs would have been made a lot by hand and hand tools in, when it was made here in the old schoolhouse originally in the 60s. But when they moved to the newer place in the 70s, they got in machinery to do a lot of the heavy work. So the hand tools were done for the carving of the, the, the shamrock at the back and fitting the chairs together. When we started here we used to use hand planes like this to finish joining tops before we glued the tabletops up. Nowadays we don't need to, the machines are better, we don't need to use it at all. This is a screwdriver we used to use before for, join, for screwing down tops of tables and stuff before we started using the cordless screwdrivers. When we're making the chairs, we start off the back leg, so we would get them out of a big block of four inch teak, and we'd have to cross cut them to size and then bandsaw the leg out and do the morsing and tenants on it then and carve the shamrock on the back. This is the, well, we call it the old Irish chair known as the tomb chair or the Sligo chair. It's very distinctive that it has a one piece back leg that's got out of a single block of timber. The seat then, is next to be made off of the back and it is made from four pieces of timber in a triangle. These are mortised and tented with dowels put through. The front legs goes through the front of the leg and they are wedged. The peg there is, 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 the, is the main joint of the chair, it keeps the whole chair together. This is the, the old Irish armchair. It is different from the chair that the, the, the seat is a lot longer and wider. This joint here is a fairly difficult joint to do because you, it's, it's in on the front leg. You have to get the exact measurement of the leg that will fit in tightly, but not too tight that it won't split there. We have the tenant in there, it, it, it gives the height of the seat and it also secures the leg and for the arm to go onto. And then there's lathe work done here for the round tenant, which is pegged as well. Our Irish chair, Tradition Revisited, focuses on one particular type of object, a chair, and one particular design of chair, the three-legged Sligo or tomb chair. I hope this exhibition shows that just looking at one object in a museum can be really interesting. You can be intrigued about who was the first person to make this chair. Perhaps you might even think about making one yourself. Or you might think about your own chairs. All of the chairs you have sat on, and which was your favourite? Who might have made it? And what materials have they used? The National Museum of Ireland Country Life invites you to visit. The museum is for everybody. Come and see for yourself. Explore, learn and enjoy what the museum has to offer.